Fenomena To the living God No one can deny That Jesus Christ So we coming to the end of a very, very, very good sermon series. This sermon series has been challenging, but in a very good way. But in a very good way. And I can say this about this sermon series, and I may not be able to say it about every one of them, but my life has changed. I'm changed. I'm not the same person that I was before I came into this sermon series on love. Not, not that I just learned a lot of information about love. That's not it at all. Although... One of the things that I recognized as I went through this series is how little I really knew about real love, right? I just didn't know anything about it. But, but, but it connected me. This, this sermon series has connected me uh, to the people around me like never before. Uh, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we've gone through it uh, one thing at a time, one Greek word at a time. Uh, today, we're going to look at love endures all things. Love endures all things. And, and even before I get started, I just want just to stop and, and just dispel everything that you think about enduring. Because when I read this verse a long time ago, and when this verse was read at my wedding, um, and when I've seen this verse as I've, as, as I've read the Bible, I've always thought that this verse meant that love puts up with other people's stuff. Because my whole understanding of love was through the eyes of me. It was a selfish view of love. And so I always read this to mean that love endures all the stuff that I don't like about my wife or all the mistakes or the issues that I have with my kids or, or all the pain and and, and little quirky things that I don't like about people at work, that love endures that kind of stuff. And, and that's not what this means at all. Th this doesn't look at the relationships that we are in at all. Paul's not saying uh, that love endures those faults in the people. He's already talked about the patience and kindness and, and selfishness. He's already discussed all that. What Paul is talking about here is something much bigger and it's something that I think we miss. What Paul is talking about is our ability to endure, to love in the midst of the storm. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about this. This word that he's using, we're going to get into it in just a second, is more of a military-style world. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with personal relationships. It's talking about when you're under attack, when you're in the middle of a storm, can you still love those people that are around you? That's what, it's, that's what this word is about. Can you endure in love, when everything's coming at you, can you endure in love? I talked to my sister this week, and I know a lot of you guys are very familiar uh, with Brandy. She's over in Texas, actually in Corpus Christi. They were in the eye of the storm. I just want to just uh, report to you guys that she's doing well. She had to leave and go to, uh, to San Antonio. But as I began to kind of study, let me tell you something. When you have somebody you love in the middle of something, you'll, you'll get on Google and you'll start trying to figure that thing out. All of a sudden, it became news as if that storm was getting ready to hit Charlotte for me. Uh, and so even before I take a step further, I want you guys to keep them in prayer. Let's keep that whole coast of Texas in prayer. They're being, a, they're being hit hard right now. Category 3 storm. I think the biggest storm that's hit in 10 years in that area. I think they're expecting some crazy numbers of rain. I've heard stuff between 20 and 40 inches of rain in some areas. We need to keep that entire region in prayer. We need to keep that entire region in prayer. But as I began to study about storms, and I began to study about what Paul is saying to us when he's telling us that we have to endure all, this whole thing started to connect. The Holy Spirit started to speak to my heart like never before. And then the first thing that I came to was this understanding of storms. See, see what Paul knows and what you know 
And, and what, what I hope we all know is that the Christian walk is full of storms. That, that being a man of God, full of storms. Being a woman of God, full of storms. Being a kid, of, and you put God first at school, full of storms. Anytime you do anything for God, there are going to be these storms that come. And as I begin to look at the difference between what they're doing in Corpus Christi right now and all up in Houston and all throughout that entire Gulf area, and what we're doing, so what they, what they have to do inside of a coastal region and what we do in Charlotte where we rarely ever get a storm. E even if the storm makes it in, it's, it's, it just takes too long. It's too far away from the coast for the full impact to come in. We have a lot more liberty when it comes to, to hurricanes, right? Even tornadoes in this region. As I begin to understand what it is that they have to do for storms, it began to open my eyes to what, what Paul is saying about enduring all things. First of all, when it comes to storms, the thing that they have to understand is that uh, storms are expected. W when you're on this beautiful stretch of land, all these beautiful beaches, these palm trees, all this beautiful green grass, and, and all this, uh, these beach houses and all that stuff, the expectation that you have when you move there is that potentially one day you're going to be caught up in a storm. Matter of fact, you know it. Y you expect it. And what Paul is saying to us today, I'm talking about 2,000 years later, when he's telling us to be prepared to endure all things, the first thing he's saying is, you need to expect that there are going to be storms. You've got to expect it. See, see, we're not expecting storms in Charlotte, so guess what? We're not prepared for storms. It's another thing that I started to see. I began to hear on the news how they've got all these evacuation routes. I mean, that's just like standard stuff. The highways are already set up. When a storm comes, people go this way and people go that way. There are no questions about where to go. People are prepared uh, for the storms there. They, they've already got inside of their garage. Brandy called me and said, uh, we're putting wood in the windows. Now, we're boarding up the windows. And I was like, oh, my God, that's got to be terrible to go to Lowe's right now because I'm sure everybody in the city is at Lowe's and Home Depot. And she said, no, actually, every garage already has, for the windows at the house, boards that are already cut up. They're already prepared for a storm because they expect a storm. And let me just talk to somebody for a second. The reason why you struggle in some of the storms of your life is because you haven't prepared for the storm. You, you don't expect the storm. You thought, hey, once I gave my hand to Christ, once I got married, once I, once I graduated from school, once I, once I moved forward for Christ and stood for Christ, that the devil was going to lay down and everything was going to be all right. No! That's not how it works. And that's why the preacher man is standing there in front of you and your bride or, or your groom, and he's telling you, now listen, you got to do this thing in sickness and in health. He, he, he's trying to let you know that, 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 that this thing, I know it's great today while we're standing up here in front of all these people and everybody's smiling and they're getting ready to throw rice and, and whatever it is that they're getting ready to do, that there are going to be some times when all of us go home. Hallelujah. There are going to be some times when all of us go home and the storm is going to come. And, and if your marriage, if your relationship is not on sound footing, that storm could potentially rip you guys apart. But, but, but not only are they prepared and expecting, but, but as I begin to take a closer look at it, they're built for storms. They don't have any of this, uh, you know, prefab houses and vinyl siding and all this stuff that we get away with, with in Charlotte. They don't build houses like that in that area. If you're close to the beach, your house might be on stilts. If you're sitting near the coast, your house is definitely going to be brick or concrete or solid wood. It's going to be some type of substance that's aerodynamic, that can handle the wind, that can handle the rain. They don't have basements for the most part. Why? Only, only flood. They're built for the storm. And what Paul is telling us 2,000 years ago, he's telling you, listen, you need to be built for the storm. You need to understand that the storms are going to come. You need to prepare yourself and you need to do some things differently. You need to change yourself. So when the storms come, you've already got your boys. You boarded up. You've already built yourself up. You own a solid foundation. 
When a storm come in your life, when the job loss comes, when, when the issues at work come, when, when the issues with the siblings come, when, when, when the friends just start hating on you, those things should not impact the way you love other people. Let me just tell somebody something. There are some people that you ought to be close to, some people you went to high school with, some people you went to college with, some people that you ought to be close to, but you're not close to them right now because a storm came in your life and a storm came in their life and things got busy and you started raising kids, that was a storm, or you started working and that was a storm and you had all these things to come, up, come in your life and an agape love relationship has been laid on the sideline. And God puts us together with people in agape love relationships. Friends, siblings, that's a sister that needs you, somebody. Hallelujah. And I know you're busy and I know you got the storms of life going on and, and you got wind blowing at you and you got to get the kids back to school and you got to do all that stuff. But let me just tell you somebody something today. A lot of people have kids. I, want, I just want to talk to somebody today because you kind of see your, your storm as to be unique to you. Listen, a lot, a lot of folk have jobs. And a lot of people work with crazy people. And, and, and folk who coming after them. A lot of folk are married to somebody and they're having trouble in their marriage. It's not just you. But you need to be built. You need to build yourself up. You need to build your family. You need to build your marriage up. You need to build your children up. So when the storm comes to your children's life, they don't get strung out on drugs. Hallelujah. Let's look at this word in the Greek, what, what Paul is, is using here. Still in 1 Corinthians, we've only got to the seven, seven verse. Well, we've, we've been here for about uh, two or three months, seven verse. That's how we're going to do it. That's how, we, that's how we're going to do it. I, I want us to be a church w that really, really gets into the Word. There's a lot of things we can do to make people feel good for a moment. But if we can get into this Word and we can apply it in our lives, we can change. Uh, not just in this place. We can change this whole world. I, I believe in my heart that we can change this whole world from 28215. But, but let's look what Paul's saying. Paul says... Love bears all things. We, we talked about that a few weeks. Love is a roof. Think about the storm. Think about what's going on down there. If, if you're weak on the roof, some folk are going to come back to, to, to something. They're going to be sitting in the house, and there's going to be water coming in with them. And if we're weak in our love, we're covering those people that we love, then, then we cause issues. He says not only that, but it believes all things. And that wasn't that gullible thing. But that was looking for the best inside of situations. He says it, it hopes all things, meaning that we, all, we, we don't have to be optimistic. That's not what it's saying. We don't want to say that it's sunny outside when it's midnight. That's not what God is or Paul or anybody with sense is asking for you to do. But, but you need to be hopeful. You need to know that the person laying on that bed can get up one day. You need to know in your heart, if it be God's will for that person, that that marriage can be saved. You need to know that that child that's going wayward, that, can, that child can be brought back. You need to hope for those things. And, and the day we land at this new place, Paul says, love endures all things. And, and what this word means is, is uh, hupam, you know, Panta, of course, panta means all things, but hupami no, it basically means that love is able to stand firm during the storms of life. That's, that's really what it means. That, that when things are happening in your life, love is able to stand firm. Doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Doesn't matter what you've lost. Doesn't matter what you stand to lose. During the worst times, the hardest times, the biggest storms in your life, you still can say, I love you to your wife. You still can call a friend or, or, or a sibling and let them know that you're still praying for them and thinking about them, even though their situation may be even better than your situation. In some instances, uh, it may even be envy on your side. Why, why does this person never go through a storm? Why am I always going through storms? But love, even in that instance, picks up the phone and says, hey, you crossed my heart today. I, I love you. Why is that? Because, because love endures all things. And so what I want to do is I want to go over to the new edition 
Uh, and, and before I go over, before I go over, I want to make sure that you guys understand where I'm getting ready to take you to. I'm not talking about the new edition uh, commentary. I'm not talking about the, the new edition Bible. Uh, I want to read you a few verses from new edition. <laughs> from new edition. Uh, and I'm going to let somebody down because I'm not about to quote anything out of Candy Girl. I, I know some of you guys like Candy Girl, Blue Moon, some of those old tunes. But what I want to talk with you about, it, it comes out of Can You Stand the Rain? And, and going into this, that is the question for this entire sermon. The question I have for you, but even before I go into these verses, is a very simple question. Can you stand the rain? Things are not going to always be great at this church. We're going to have our issues. We're going to have our problems. We're a lot of flawed people trying to lift Christ up in the same time. We, we're building this thing. We're figuring it out day by day. But can you stand the rain? I, I, things are not going to be perfect in your marriage. I need to tell somebody that. I know that you saw the movie and the, the, the sun was out and the birds were singing and all that stuff. That's not reality. Can you stand the rain? Raising children, it's going to have its ups and downs. But the question that I have for you going into this, you got to get this, guys. Can you stand the rain? I know, I know, I know school hadn't been fair. I know, I know work hadn't been fair. I know things are hard. The economy is hard. I know all these things. Can you stand the rain? That's the question that you need to be able to answer yourself. And I, I just love the way that they, the way they, way they ask this question. They start out with a question and then they give you some explanation. It starts out with him saying, on a perfect day, when, when it's sunny outside like today, when it's beautiful outside, I see you here now. I know you're here now, but if it was raining today, would you be here? He says, on, on a perfect day, I know that I can count on you. He said, but when that is not possible, so when it's not perfect, when it's not sunny outside, when things are not going right, when you don't have money in your pocket, when you hurt, when you broke, when you lose somebody, when you lose a job, when you're going through some stuff that you've never been through and I ain't going to be able to guess up here. Can you weather the storm? Why, why, why does he ask that question? He asks that question because we all need somebody, that's what he's saying, who will stand by us. Don't we need that? You need that. That's what you need. That's what you need. That's what you want. You want somebody that no matter what's going on in their life or your life will stand by you. That's what your children want. They, they want somebody when they're doing great and they're shooting the shots and they, they're making the grades and they are, they're doing everything they're supposed to do. They're getting all the accolades. But, but when they have some trouble... Can, when, when they're going through some things, when, when folk at school are attacking them, when the studies don't come easy for them, when the test's not easy for them, when they make mistakes, because you made mistakes, I made mistakes, we all made mistakes, when they make mistakes, when they have issues, can you be somebody that can stand with, with me by them? He, he says, because I need somebody who will stand by me through the good times and the bad times, not just when things are great. Your sister, your brother, they need somebody. Your parents, they need somebody who can stand by them when things are good and when things are bad. You will always be, always be right there. When, when, the, when the storm comes in, do you leave? When things get busy in your life, when, will I know whether or not you got things together based on by how you love me? Will I feel your pain and your misery and the things that are going on in your storm based on the way you treat me? Will you love me when it's good in your life and when it's bad in your life? That's what, that's what couples, that's what, that's what you want to know. Singles, that's what you want to find. Somebody who's going to stand with you in good and bad, through sicker or, or well. When money is there, when money is not there, that's what the vow is. And those vows, they cover every relationship. There's not a relationship between siblings, between parents, where those vows don't cover. There's not a relationship that is agape where those vows don't make sense. Let's go a little bit further. He says, sunny days, just like today. Everybody loves sunny days. We all love sunny days. But can you stand it when it rains? Everybody loves
loves it when the bills are paid. Everybody loves it when, when you graduate. Everybody loves those days. But can you stand it when, when the bills can't be paid? When, when they pull up and, and they take your car. When they kick you out your house. When you go to, to buy your groceries and, and it decline and you don't have no food to eat. Can you stand the rain? He says because, because storms will come. That's no doubt. That's what Paul is saying. That's what the people on the coast, that's what they realize. That storms are going to come. That is why they expect them. That's why they prepare for them. Think about what I'm saying here. That's why they build themselves. They undergird themselves with storms. He says because storms are going to come. This we know for sure, but the question that we need to get answered is, can you stand the right? Can you stand the right? Can you handle it when, when you get sick and your body won't get well and, and, and every day you wake up aching and in pain and, and, and you don't understand why you're the only person in the world that's got this pain because this pain is so intense that you got to be the only person that's suffering from it. And can you get up with, with arthritis and, 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 and migraines and all kind of pain and check on your sister? Can, can, can you, when things are going tough at work, man, and, and your money's at stake, and how are you going to feed your family? Can you still be kind and patient with your children? Can you still love them when everything's going bad, when the storm is in? That's the question. And, and, and as I began to kind of think about this, because what Paul is saying is, if you are a Christ follower, now if you're not a Christ follower, this, is, this don't mean nothing to you because he said they'll know you by this agape love. So if you're not a Christ follower and you're just kind of hanging out, that's cool. We, you know, this will make sense to you as well. You could apply some of this, but if you're not a Christ follower, you're not really held to it. But if you are a Christ follower, you ought to know that storms are coming. And when those storms come, they should not change the way you treat your boo. That there's going to be pain in your body. And that pain in your body should not change the way you treat your boo. There are going to be some things that you really wanted to go in your direction. They're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. Things are going to happen. Storms are going to come. This we know for sure. But can you stand the rain? And, and so, so I got to this place as I began to just dig into this. Because listen, this is life changing for somebody. Because it was life changing for me. This is life changing for somebody today. And, and, and I began to see, we have some challenges with standing in the rain, right? We have some challenges with, with enduring love. And, and the first challenge that we have with, with it is that, to be honest, we're not really exposed to it. If we were honest, and I know, don't, don't put mom and dad on front street. We, I'm not trying to, trying to get you to do that. I'm not, that's not what I'm trying to get you to do. But if you were to be honest, you just haven't been exposed to enough healthy, enduring relationships. You've been around folk who just stayed, just made it happen, just, want, you know, it's in this room, that room, because they, because they wanted to, not because they had to. We understand that. I know enduring couples, people with enduring love that sleep in different rooms because of health issues. But, 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 but we've just been around folk who just kind of go through the motions. We, we just haven't been exposed to this enduring love where it's about even when the storm comes, you're going to still put them first. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the funny things to me was uh, they left, Brandy and, and, uh, and, and my brother, Walter, and the kids. We, they just had a baby. And, and I thought, well, God, what are you saying to me? Is that enduring to leave? He said, yeah, that's preparing. They were prepared. Some people needed to leave, could, could leave. They prepared. He said, but, but what I want you to understand is, this is the thing that I want you to drill down into is, it's very okay for a family to get up and leave from a situation. It's not okay for a man to get up. What would have happened? What I would have, I would have been, in somebody else would have been preaching, right? <laughs> if Brandy had called me and said, now, Walter is gone to San Antonio because he was afraid that the power would go out. He wasn't going to be able to work or whatever. And me and the kids are here. You know, I, I would have been heading to, to Corpus Christi, right? And that's what God was saying. Uh, it, it's not that, um, that they left, but it's the fact is that if, if they were to leave, and what happens a lot of times in these situations, one person leaves. 
And they leave the other people, the family, everybody sitting in the middle of that storm, right? The, the storm comes in, and that's what we see. We see it all the time. That's what we're exposed to. We're exposed to divorce. We're exposed to, to hurt, to pain, to people not speaking to each other, to obvious stuff. I'm not talking about what we see. I'm not talking about what we read bet between. We, we're exposed to people with, 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 with two different people. Two people married and with two people. Four people in this marriage. I don't even know how that makes sense. That's what we're exposed to. And, and, and not only are we not exposed to it, check this out. We're not required to do it. See, there's nobody any that's going to judge you if you get divorced, if you, if you get tired of your kids and you decide, you know what, I'm not doing nothing else for them. No good, deadbeat, I done did everything, fed them, spent time with them. I'm just done with them. I ain't going to speak to my sister no more. You know, you can even tell somebody this stuff. And nine times out of ten, you're going to be talking to somebody that's going to be just nodding. You, you're not required to do any of this stuff anymore. That's no, there's no requirement for you to stay in the rain. Actually, what, what, what people would expect for you is that if things are not going well in your marriage, find your soulmate, right? If things are not going well with your children, let them go. They'll be fine. You can go have some more children, adopt, go volunteer, do something. Things are not going well with your siblings, just stop talking to them. That, that, that's what's, that's, there's no requirement nowadays. You know, we, when we think back on a time, and we like to think about a time, it was 50 years ago. Everything was on a black and white TV. The, the parents were sleeping in separate beds. That world is gone. That world is gone. That's plenty of exchange, exchange siblings. Siblings that haven't talked to each other. That's, that's plenty of, 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 of divorced people. Now, let me just say, let me just tell you, the statistics show Statistics show that half of the marriages are going to end in, in divorce. The statistics show, I'm not talking about some I'm making up, that 76% of young black children are not going to have any contact with their biological father. That's what the statistics show. The statistics show that even if you're not black, if you're just in America, 40% of all children in the school right now, they, they, they don't have a father at home. 40%. Think about what I'm saying. Now, if African-Americans, if we line nine kids up across the front of the stage, six of them have no father. For all Americans, if we were to line up 10 kids, four of them have no contact with their biological father. How, how, how are we going to teach this generation what it means to endure when they never even had it to start with? And, and this is new. This is the old family secret because... Many of you have an older uh, auntie that's from another, many of you, see we've been hiding this stuff for too long. Many of you know the issues that have been going on inside of your families and we hid it and we didn't talk about it and we didn't address it as a church and all those things just kept building and building and building and now six out of nine kids don't have a daddy. Where's the daddy? Probably sleeping on your couch because we we don't require it anymore. And then and finally, what I notice is that when it comes to enduring love, we're, we're not equipped for it. And what do I mean by equipped? Check this out. I, I did a little bit of research. So if you think about what it requires for us to be equipped to be in a marriage, when you talk to psychologists, marriage therapists, and pastors, this is the common list that I come up with. So all the whole time that you were growing up in your house with your siblings and with your mom and dad, you, you would have had to receive an abundance of acceptance, affection, approval, attention, comfort, encouragement, respect, security, and support. If you're missing any of this stuff right here, listen, what the experts say, the pastors, what the experts say, uh, the psychologist, what the experts say, the marriage therapist, is that your marriage, your relationship, and, and not just marriages, any relationships are in jeopardy of, because you're not equipped to be in a relationship of agape-style love. It, just, 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 just listen to me. We're not equipped for this. Because my house 
didn't look like this. Now, somebody's house probably looked like this, but, but this isn't what I got growing up. Now, now, I'm trying to do this for my children, but I'll be honest with you, I'm falling a little short. And so the only way that we can ever have enduring love is through Christ. So, so, so how do we get that, that enduring love? How do we get to the place? Because we have some issues. We have some gaps. We, we've got some stuff that we need to fix. Listen, listen, I'm praying over marriages that God would send a new spirit of, of enduring love. I'm praying over our singles, that as you guys are out there now, that, that, that you are connecting with people that you can have enduring love relationships with. I don't want you to have anything less. I'm praying for our children, and I'm praying for you guys. Some of you guys won't get married for 10 years. I'm already praying for you guys. I'm already praying that God will, will bless the families of your future child, of, of, the, of their child, of your future husband or your future wife. I'm already, we're already praying for that. We're already praying that things will be in order so that you can experience what you deserve, which is enduring love. And then we're going to teach you on this side what it means to have enduring love because we're, we're not just trying to get this for you so you can be happy. We want to make sure that you're in a situation where, where you can be successful. And so what Paul does in Hebrews 12 is he teaches us everything that we need to hear and understand about having enduring love. If you want to know the answer to how can I stand the rain, all we got to do is look at what Paul is saying here in chapter 12. He says, therefore, now anytime you see therefore, you always need to stop and ask the question, why is it therefore? Anytime you see therefore, you just pause for a second to see why it's therefore. And, and what, the reason why it's there for is because in chapter 11, Paul has walked through all these people who endure great things. He's gone through the entire list, Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Sarah, everybody. He's talked about everybody. And he showed them how, God, how they stuck to God through enduring love, how they took care of their families, how they kept hold of the promise. He gets to the end of that, and he begins to talk about several of them, many of them who never saw what they thought they were going to get. He tells them, I know that, that uh, some people went to their grave not getting the promise or what they thought was promised, but, but then he gives the good news. He says, and although they didn't get it on earth, the reason why they didn't get it on, on earth is because God has something better for them. And, and I want to talk to somebody for a second because uh, God's got something better for you. You, you may not see everything. Don't worry about the success. Don't worry about, you know, the bank account. Don't worry about the house. Don't worry about whether you're married or not. Don't worry about the kids. Don't worry about whether you're going to have kids or not. Don't worry about that. Because if God doesn't give you the promise that he has for you right now, it's only because he got something better for you. And, and what he says in, in verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Now, a lot of people look at this different ways. Some people uh, would say that what Paul is talking about is that all those people who've died and gone to heaven. Now, you got a whole nother theology. We're not going to get into that. We're not going to pick sides today. We'll, we'll figure out some time to talk about it. Who believes that the Bible clearly says when you die, you just go into a sleep place? Like you're not up in heaven. Like, you know, we, we've got some Maybe some incorrect uh, home theology we, you know, we, we attribute is almost close to witchcraft. You know, oh, daddy, thank you for that. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. There's no evidence in the Bible that daddy died, went to heaven. I'm talking to somebody and is now pulling strings up in heaven for you, watching after you and in the room with you. And you don't want daddy in the room with you because everything you do in the room, you don't want daddy to see. And so you might be happy. That that's not how it is, but there's evidence, and I'm not trying to make an argument today. I'm just telling you, there's evidence that when we die, we go to sleep. We don't get, I, I can't tell you one thing. We've got to stop this. You ain't going to get angels. You're not going to become an angel. You're not going to get wings. And we say that incorrect stuff in the church and sometimes from the pulpit. Baby gone now. She got her wings. Not correct. Angels and humans, two different things. All right. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to stay on target, but I'm, let me get back now. But, 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 but what he's saying is now, now, now for this conversation, let, let's, let's, let's assume that for, for what I'm teaching you today about endurance is that this is just the people who are around you 
This is the folks at church. This is your mama and them. This is your cousin. Because what you need to understand is as you go through life and you're challenged, you got a crowd of witnesses looking at you. And what they want to know is, are you going to do what you said? What you said you was going to do. What the question that they have for you is, can you stand the rain? That's what your crowd of witnesses want to be. And for each one of us, it's a different crowd. And your crowd may be one person. Your crowd may be 100 people. But you got a crowd of witnesses. I'm talking about on earth. I'm not talking about in heaven. I'm we're not arguing that, but I'm just saying that's what I'm talking about. That you need to worry about what's on earth. Don't even worry about what they seeing in heaven. You need to worry about what, what, what the people around you are seeing when it comes to your faith. He says, so let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And he says, the, the only way that you can endure, I mean really endure, and, 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 and I don't want to talk about sin today. That's not what I want to talk about. But, 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 but what Paul is communicating is it's going to be pretty hard for you to endure the storm of your life while you got the sin issue going on. You know what I'm trying to say? While you out here doing this inappropriate thing and you know it's inappropriate, while you got that going on and then all of a sudden you get laid off and now you got that going on and the layoff going on and next thing you know you're drinking, right? And, and what Paul is saying, we've got to get to a place where we put down the sin and not just the sin. But the weights, we got some weights on us. I'm, I'm going to show you, share my, one of my weights. One of my weights is, uh, don't judge me, but one of my weights is, is, is music. I, I, lo I love it, man. I love music. Uh, old school stuff, not, not new school stuff. That's not music. I, uh, I, don't, I don't like none of the new stuff. It's not, not music. But I'm talking about the old stuff. When love and fun and, and that kind of stuff. I, I love it, but I know that's a weight. And, and, and the difference between a sin and a weight is the sin is defined. Don't do that. Thou shalt not do that. But, but the weight is that thing that you like to do that's not necessarily defined. Nobody ain't told you that you can't, you know, smoke that. Nobody ain't told you that you can't. Because in the Bible, it don't say don't smoke that or don't take this. Or in the Bible, it don't say don't drink this. Or don't, you know, you got some room to interpret the Bible on your weight. But, but it's a weight. And it's hindering you. And, and when you go through the storm, that very weight is going to be the thing that pulls you down, that drowns you. Uh, imagine being in the middle of the water and the water starts to race and, and you're trying to stay afloat and you keep getting pulled down because you got this big rock tied to your ankle and you're trying to stay above the water, well, what are you going to do? You're either going to drown or you're going to get rid of that weight. Listen, that slows us down. That's what the words say. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to read into this. I'm just reading it. He said, and let us run with what? Endurance. The race that is before us. You can't run with endurance, the race that is before you in your marriage when you got sin and waste, when you got other stuff that is before God, yes, you can't raise your kids like that. Stuff before God, sin and waste. Yeah, you can't have a relationship with your siblings when you got stuff that you got in front of God and sin going on in your life. No. Can't do it. Stop it. Verse 2, he says, we just said verse 2. <laughs> get, get, get your, build yourself up. Build yourself up. Paul says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. That's how we do it. That's how we endure. By keeping our eyes on Jesus. Because why? Because Jesus is the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. That's why. You weak. You got sins. You got weights. As I'm talking to you, you got a list of things going on in your head. Sins and weights. Things that you need to get rid of. But you haven't been able to get rid of it. But guess what? You've got a savior. You, you got somebody, if you really took it to them, if you really took it to Jesus, if you really took it to him, not, not kind of took it to him, not created your own plan, took it to him. Not, not took it to him, but, but not really. Not, not pray for strength while you're doing it. You know, we do that sometimes. Lord, Lord give me strength. Put me in the, in the temptation, but give me strength to get through it. And you, really what you want to do is get in the temptation so you can fall in it. I know it. Listen, I've been there. He says, but you got a champion. You got somebody who can perfect your, your faith. He said, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, 
disregarding its shame. So, so what he's saying is, one of the keys to being able to endure is to be able to keep your eyes on the joy that's out in front of you. Jesus was able to go to the cross and be crucified because he kept his eyes on the resurrection. And if you get in a place in your life with raising children, with your family, at work, anywhere, where you can keep your eyes on the joy, keep your eyes on the prize, and not focus on the cross, you can endure anything. There's no problem. There's nothing that, that the enemy can attack you with. There's nothing that he can take from you. He has no power over you. Somebody needs to understand there is no sin that has power over you. There is no weight that has power over you. There is no circumstance that has power over you. You can lose it all like Job. And God can give you back double for your trouble. But, but you got to keep your eyes on joy. That's what Jesus did. He said, he said now... Guess what? Because he kept his eyes on joy, because he endured, because he kept moving forward, he is now seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Now, he's up. No question about where Jesus is. He's up there. You, you want to pray to somebody? You want somebody to move in your situation? Don't, don't, don't pray to granddad. Don't pray to dad. Don't pray to mama, grandmama. Pray to Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. There's no issue, no situation that he can't show up in in your life. Let's go a little bit further. He says, in verse 3 and 4, it says, Think of, of all the hostility he endured. Talking about Jesus from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you haven't given your life in this struggle against sin. You, you haven't. What, what have you done? What have we done? You know, we think we get to a point where we say something like, I can't take no more. I'm not doing no more. I'm leaving that church. I'm leaving this marriage. I'm leaving these children. I can't take no more. And what Paul is saying, until you've had the hair on your face pulled out of your beard, un until you've had a crown of thorns put on your head and pressed down so that your own blood just rolled down your face, until you've been beaten with a cat of nine tails, with whips that had glass and bones and steel in it, ripping the skin out of your back, uh, until you had to carry your 100-pound cross, uh, until you got crucified, until you were up, put up naked. Now, I know the pictures that we see have Jesus with, with loincloth on, but the reality of it is most humiliating, painful, excruciating death possible. He is naked. He is bleeding. He has nails in his arms and in his legs. He has a sign above his head, mocking him as the king of the Jews. He has people spitting in his face, and yet and still he endured. And what have you been through? What have you done? What, what did you do for that child that you feel like you've done enough for? What did you do for that, that, that parent that you feel like you've done enough for? What did you do for that friend? What did you do for that sibling? What did you do? This isn't about what you did. You know, this is, about, this is about your ability to stand the rain. And in those instances, you, 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 you haven't proven that you can stand the rain. That's what this is about. So, there's a couple things I want you to consider that I'm getting out of your way. First of all, I want you to consider the crowd. You know, when I started talking about, I was amazed at the eye contact. You know, we are high a uh, two-parent house church. But, but just because we had a lot of two-parent houses don't mean we saw it all right. And we need to get to a place where we can kind of show more of what it means to have enduring love. And, and what I want to encourage you today to do is to consider the crowd, all those people who are watching you, married folks, all those people who are watching you. Parents, all those people who are watching you as a Christian raise your child and how you treat them and how you talk to them. Do you give them mercy? Do you give them grace? Do you encourage them? Do you give them all that stuff on that list? Siblings, I want you to consider the crowd. All those people listening to you, watching you. Look at First Thessalonians. It says, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope 
in our Lord Jesus Christ. And what this verse is saying is, listen, the crowd is watching you. And when they see you make it to, to year 50 in your marriage, 40 in your marriage, when they see you with those children at the graduation, when they see you spending time with those children, when they see you at the family reunion, or spending time with your family, being around, when they see you working at the church and doing those things that God has called you to do, they're encouraged by that. You're exposing them. See, the question no, no longer is, what were you exposed to? You can't control that. That's gone. What were, you, what were you control? What were you exposed to? That's been gone. The question, parents, is what have you exposed your children to? What have you taught them about enduring love? What have you taught them about being kind as they watch you and your spouse? What, what have you taught uh, your siblings? I know you guys, we got issues. We, we were raised, all of us were raised in some issues and stuff. But what are we doing now that's going to make a difference not only do I want you to consider the crowd, that's very important, but I want you to consider the power that you have in Christ. Somebody has a sin and a weight. You know it. Listen to me. Yes, I'm going to tell you now, God is talking to you. Yes, your issue is getting out of control. Yes, you need to put down the substance. Yes, you need to move forward. Yes, you need to let it go. Yes, I'm talking to you. Yes. You need to change your attitude. Yes. You need to stop giving up on people. You need to learn how to endure. You need to be patient. Yes. I'm talking to you. You don't have to ask the question, is God, was that for me or not? Yes. Absolutely. It's time for you to move toward, toward enduring love. And the only way that you're going to do that is to understand that whatever issues or weights that you have, listen, God, you've got a Christ that... That can, that can get you through it. Look at this right here in Colossians. It says, being strengthened listen, with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. Not just endurance. Great endurance with your children. Great endurance with your spouse. Great endurance with your siblings. Great endurance with your parents. Because of the power of Christ. Not because of you. You don't have enough power to stop doing what I'm talking to you about. You, if, if I'm wrong, show me. Come to me and, and let me know. I put it down. I, I did it on my own. But, but, but what Paul is saying is, listen, you got a Christ that can do this for you. You got power in this. But, but, but not just consider your power that you have in Christ, but, but, but finally I want you to consider the benefits of endurance. Look what, look what he says here, James, brother Jesus says, chapter 5, he says, we give great honor, great honor to those who endure. That's what a lot of us want. We want to be honored, you know, ain't nothing wrong with that. We like to have somebody say, good job. Th this is where the great honor comes from. He says, we give great honor to those who endure suffering. When, when things are hard, when the storms come and you are able to stand during the storm, that's where the honor comes from. Anybody can stand when it's sunny outside, but can you stand the rain? He said, for, for instance, you know about Job, you guys, yeah, we all know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. So although Job went through a lot of struggles and he had to endure a lot, at the end, Job got double for his trouble. He did. Could, 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 could he erase what he lost? Yeah, he lost some kids. Could he erase any of that? No, he still had to struggle. He still had pain. But at the end, God showed him kindness. And, and not only kindness, but, but it says that the Lord was also full of tenderness and mercy. He, he, he addressed all of Job's issues. Imagine being in a place where God is kind to you, where he's merciful to you, where he's tender with you. And, and that's the place where, where, where you're going to be as you endure. And, and that's, what I wanna, that's what I'm here to do. I'm, I'm, here, I'm, here, I'm here to ask you just this one question. And, and, and it's a simple question. Can you stand the rain? We're trying to build something here at this church. It won't be easy. It's going to require for you to have to come out and knock on some doors and talk to some people and tell some people about Jesus. Why does that sound like it's such a hard task, right? That's great stuff, right? We ought to be excited about that. But can you stand the rain? We, we're going to go through some stuff here. 
Everybody's not going to speak. Some days we're going to have some challenges and some issues. But can you stand the rain? Can you stand the rain in your marriage? I know you're going through some stuff. We're all going through some stuff. Anybody married going through some stuff, you can act how you want to act. You can pretend how you want to pretend. But, but, but can you stand the rain when you're raising your children? Can you handle it? Are, are you like Charlotte? You know, Charlotte's not ready for storms. You know, when a little bit of rain comes through Charlotte, our trees start to fall, right? Because they don't have deep roots. We got big trees, but they don't have deep roots. And, and, and this, is my, this is my worry for, for some of us, is that we look like big love trees. We, we look like these big, massive, great people. You know, we're doing all these things outwardly with no deep roots. See, everything in the terrain is different. When you go out to the coast, the roots go, roots go deep because those trees have to be able to endure. And the question is, are you prepared? Are you ready? Are you expecting? Are you getting yourself in a situation where you can stand the rain. I'm going to leave you with this this week. I will stand the rain in my life by loving while enduring like Jesus Christ. And I want you to think about that for a second. Just think about that for a second. How that changes so many relationships in your life. For, I said this at the beginning. There are some relationships that when it started storming in your life 20 years ago, you just lost contact with very close people. There's some relationships that are going on right now in your life that you are distant. There's some distance in some houses. You know, you stay in the same place with some people and you're distant because of storms that are going on. And what Paul is exhorting us to do is to no matter what's going on, no matter what we're faced with, for us to get to a place where we always love, no matter how hard it is, no matter how tough it is, we always love like Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Here we stand in the presence of our Savior. And it's an honor. And it's an honor to lift our voice and sing. To the living God. To the no one can deny that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is.